And I'm Lisa, and this is The Coaching Cast. We are the No Nonsense Podcast, chatting about the things impacting you at work right now, helping you to survive and thrive in today's ever-changing workplace. We discuss different topics each episode, sharing our ideas, hints, and top tips from our experiences of working in the corporate world, running our own businesses, and also being qualified coaches. We also try to have a few laughs along the way too, because taking yourself too seriously is just boring. We hope you enjoy listening. In today's episode, we're discussing a dilemma often faced by female leaders, the likability factor. So stay with us and enjoy. Lisa, before we get into this week's episode, how are you doing? Yeah, I am good. I am back in Cape Town. So since we last spoke, I've had a couple of trips, but this is now my permanent location for the next four weeks. I am back in South Africa, back in my second home over here in the Western Cape. So yes, hence another change of scenery. So I think (laughs) think the last time we recorded, I was at my dad's just outside of Canterbury yes, in Kent. Yes, you were. Well, I've crossed the water, people. I've crossed the water. Well, actually, I've... This I strikes should... again. Yeah, Judith, Judith Chalmers is back on the road. So, yes, I'm now down in the south coast of Africa. So, I said I've crossed the water. I mean, technically, I have. But I think, actually, the way the fl- flying works is that you technically go over more land than you do sea. Oh, Okay. I mean, I'm pretty certain they don't go like that <laughs> round Africa. By that, anyone listening, I'm doing the strange motion of what it means to go around Africa. <laughs> but I don't think that's what I did. I think you go overland. Anyway, I am back on the Western Cape. I'm in South Africa. So yeah, be here for the next She's four weeks. She's back. Yeah, so back, all, baby. Reco- all recording will be done from my South African office. It's very um, nice. I have to say, I do like the kind of wooden panelling oh, behind I do. you. Yeah, lovely, yeah, like it. Thank you very much. And the fake palm. That's this this palm. Love a here, fake I palm. I think it's a fake one. But yeah, so I'm back here. Back here for the foreseeable. But yeah, no, I'm good other than that. I am, um, I, uh, well, I feel like I've got loads to tell you, actually. I don't know where to start. So okay, many things, right. So many good things have happened. Right, let's, let's scale them. The top start thing. the beginning. The top thing that's happened to me. Okay. Is I've met one of my all-time favourite hero people, favourite people. Me? Yeah. Well, yeah, obviously you're one of them. Oh, okay. you you are one of them, but I haven't. Sadly, <laughs> sadly, I haven't got to see you face to face for a little while. But no, I met, and for anyone that listens to this podcast, everyone knows that I'm as obsessed with Elizabeth Day, the journalist, writer, podcaster extraordinaire. Yeah, my wannabe best friend, um, hero, I, my hero. I met her at Shoreditch Town Hall as she was recording a live episode of her incredible podcast, How to Fail, with Sophie Ellis Bexter amazing it was amazing oh she is the loveliest person she is as lovely in real life as she comes across in her podcast and in her writing I mean seriously no bubble was burst in respect to you know you meet your idol and they were let down no she was lovely and she signed all my books and she put up with my strange awkward slightly weird obsessive ramblings about how much I thought she was amazing and how I wanted her to be part of my girl gang and it was lovely I've got a photograph of her and everything Oh, we need to get on the Insta. We need yeah. to share that on the Instagram page so I, that people can see it. I don't need to be asked twice. I'll definitely do that. But yes, <laughs> she, she is my desktop wallpaper. So I get to go at her lovely face with me every time I turn on my laptop. So yeah, that was pretty amazing. So that was at the top. That's at the top, number one. Oh gosh, I can imagine when you met Elizabeth Day, were you like girl fanning? Like, it was, oh my God, it was, this is it was, amazing. It was awful. I had to stand in the line. So this... This was the. This is how it operated. They invite you to have um, your book signed by Elizabeth and to meet her at the end of her interview. Yeah. And the recording. And she sat on this table with Sophie Ellis Bexter, who so Sophie Ellis Bexter, right? Is, oh, she's I think amazing. She is amazing, right? I think she's forty three, and she's got four kids. Yeah, she's got like a million kids. <laughs> yeah. One of whom is eighteen, I think, because she had him. Anyway, I learned all about this story because she was being interviewed by Elizabeth Day and Elizabeth was talking to her about it. So she had her first child with the guitarist out of the feeling, Richard something his name is. 
and they got pregnant within like the first month or two of even seeing one another and decided to keep the baby um and so we learned all about this but yeah so I think she's her eldest is 18 and her youngest is tiny she's just not long had her fourth child yeah she looks like she's still 25 she looks amazing I know she's amazing she looks amazing as well it was awkward because what I didn't realize was that she'd just released a book herself and it's a biography and it was available for sale at this event I went to at Shoreditch Town Hall but that wasn't made right. very obvious either and I wasn't aware that part of the reason why she was speaking to Elizabeth was because she was promoting the book. So when I got to the, when I was in this queue waiting to meet Elizabeth, one, I was shitting myself because I was about to meet my idol and I had a whole queue line to think about it. So by the time I arrived at the desk and actually met her, I obviously was a wreck um, and had completely (laughs) overthought how to behave, act, how to talk to her, the whole shebang. (laughs) And it was even more awkward because I realised that Sophie was sat there also available to sign her book and I didn't have it but actually the majority of the line did not have Sophie Ellis Bex's book. Oh no! They, PR the, fail everyone. Massive PR fail. Um, the main reason everyone was at the event was to see me listen to Elizabeth Day. They were all huge How to Fail podcast fans, me included. Um, I wasn't there to see Ellis, Sophie Ellis Bex either. Um, so it was so awkward and I made it clearly worse because I stood there and I think I took both of my Elizabeth Day books that I own to be signed and jabbered right. away at Elizabeth and told her how fucking amazing I think she is. Had my photograph taken with her. I've got I've loads of photos. And it was so awkward because I, I mean, Sophie sat next to her just watching this unfold, unfolding. And all I could offer was, I can't believe you're 43. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I was trying to offer a compliment. I don't know if that sounds like a compliment now. It doesn't sound like a compliment. No. And then I kind of dug myself into a ditch, obviously, with my nervousness and started jabbering on about why I was surprised she was 43. Oh, no. And how close in age she is to me and how you never realise how the age of your idols when you're growing up with them because you always assume they're older than you when they're you know a pop star especially honestly it just got worse and worse and then I was talking about her having kids and how she looks amazing and mainly it was it was all to compensate for the fact that I hadn't bought her bloody book so yeah I just had to kind of go congratulations on your book and it was just it was so security come at this point I just kind of like put their hands on your shoulder and just like pivot you move it was you just very slowly to the side and down the stairs away from them both like it was so imagine. embarrassing oh, it was just so embarrassing so yeah so I mean I suppose I embarrassed myself twofold but it must have been pretty embarrassing for Sophie Ellis Bex to just sit there. Yeah, I think some PR person will have got a strong talking to I, after well, this. I terrible think. job, terrible job. Yeah, awful. So yeah. so yeah, it was it was embarrassing though. It was t- typical that I like gushed all over Elizabeth, had loads of photos, got my book signed, and then just kind of did this like sympathy. I don't know what to describe it as, but it was like this afterthought and sympathetic compliment towards Sophie just to make her feel included it was just so awkward but that couldn't have I couldn't have been the only one that did that out of the entire line because loads of us were not there <laughs> anyway she was very nice but I think she probably thought I was all right twat valid oh, I'm saying. Well, <laughs> oh well it would be like me if I ever met Rosie Ramsey from the podcast yes true shag married annoyed um great podcast guys check it out um I she is like my girl crush I'm obsessed with her so I would probably act in a similar manner if I ever met Rosie Ramsey so if anybody knows Rosie Ramsey see boobies um please drop me a DM or don't (laughs) after that because I don't think Susie's really sold it in terms of how she's going to behave if she ever meets Rosie Ramsey so you're not going to be put in touch with anyone now What, what a couple of weeks I know it's been busy what about yourself um, well, I haven't insulted any celebrities accidentally. Um, so we've, yeah, so any CBS listeners, we've had a couple of um, weeks break where we have been on various trips and been doing lots of different things. So the week before I went on holiday, I had quite a crazy week. So it was just like loads going on. So um, my son, Arthur, turned three. So that was a big event in our household. Woohoo! Happy birthday, Woo-hoo! Arthur. Um, he had an amazing day, uh, an amazing time. He'd been asking about his birthday 
for what felt like to me for forever like <laughs> when is it my birthday and it finally the day finally arrived um and he was dead excited oh. when it was it was here and he really got it for the first time yeah. um so I'm dread to think what the level of excitement is going to be like at Christmas because I think it's Christmas he's going to get it for the first time as well and I'm like oh my goodness but he was really excited oh. um which kind of leads me then into like a funny situation so we then had what I've we've nicknamed in this house we've nicknamed it cake gate okay <laughs> So Kate Gates. Cake Gates. So let me okay. talk to you about Kate Gates. So his birthday was on a Tuesday and he goes to nursery on a Tuesday and he was going to go to the nursery mainly because it cost me £65 and I don't get that money back if he doesn't go. So I was like, you're going to nursery on your birthday and they can do a little party for you uh, and have a great time. And so he did. And I thought, I know, like last year I took, gave him um, a Colin Caterpillar cake to take in with him and I love a Colin Caterpillar cake. Oh, so do I. So Colin Caterpillar cakes are amazing. Or the, the official MS ones, because what's yeah. the Audi version called? Cuthbert. Cuthbert, Cuthbert that's it. the Caterpillar. Anyway, so I was like, right, I'll get you a cake. And then I just happened to mention the day before his birthday when I picked him up from nursery, I was like, oh, I've got him a cake. And they were like, no, you can't bring a cake in now because we've got children with allergies. I was like, oh, oh God. Okay. Yes. Right. All right. Makes sense. So then I had this like 12 piece Colin, the caterpillar cake in a box. And I was like, oh, because I'd also bought him a Paw Patrol birthday cake for his actual birthday with like a to- with like a topper on a Marshall topper. So Marshall is character from Paw Patrol. He's the one in the fire engine. Yeah. Arthur was obsessed with him. And it said like Arthur is three and there was like a, um, a Marshall. And so I'd also bought him a Paw Patrol one for like me, my husband and him for when he got home from nursery so we could like do cake and candles, etc. So I was like, oh no, I've also got a 16 piece cake in this Paw Patrol cake as well. So I'm currently at like, I've got enough cake for like 28 people and there's just three of us at the moment. <laughs> then, right, so I'm like, oh God. Then on the Thursday, he goes to like a play group and they were like, you can bring cakes in for his birthday, but they have to be individually wrapped cakes, like a cupcake or like those Mr. Kipling, you know, like sliced finger things. So I'd well, already why? bought so that they could dish them out better, I think, rather than like cutting cake out. I don't really know anyway. So I'd already bought 20 cupcakes. Are you with me? Yeah. So I've already got cake for 28 people. Yeah which is now just kind of hanging around, plus an additional 20 cupcakes. So I've got currently enough cake for 48 people, and there's still only <laughs> me, Steve and Arthur, and obviously the preschool kind of set up. So I was like, okay, God, this is a lot of cake. Then he was having a party on the Saturday, and I'd asked my friend and great CBB, Katie, who was a great chef. She was on MasterChef, as she mentioned. <laughs> she <laughs> Slip that in. To make a birthday cake because he wanted a strawberry birthday cake for his party. So she was making me a strawberry based cake for the party on the Saturday. That was coming. That was like arranged. That was sorted. So I have this basically excessive amount of birthday cake at this point. I can't even eat cake. I'm diabetic. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Well, it's funny you're allowed a little bit. I know you have to regulate it. I mean, you can't eat all of that cake. Because you'll have a sugar, like, so attack. I, you're right. I can have a little bit, yeah. But I basically couldn't eat 50 people's worth of cake. Like, so I then ended up having just an insane amount of cake. I was basically, like, giving it away to people on the road. I was like, the postman would, like, drop it off. I'd be like, do you want some cake? I've got some birthday cake <laughs> I can't you go like take as much as you like <laughs> oh my goodness so yeah it's become uh fondly nicknamed in our house as cake gate the time where we had enough cake for 50 people in our house and there was just three of us um well so... two and a half because you can't have very much <laughs> yeah so yeah that happened I basically had a lot of cake um that happened well I, technically I bet Arthur thought it was the best birthday he's ever had yeah he probably did actually because he's obsessed with cake like uh, he this is the first year where he was blowing the candles out. I thought he was gonna face plant this poor patrol cake <laughs> that I'd obviously done, like got for him. 
because I don't think he was so excited and he didn't know what to do with it he was like trying to blow it and I was like oh my god I think he's gonna just face plant straight <laughs> into this cake because he's so excited about it he didn't but that's gonna be very easily happened so yeah it was um <laughs> it's been a busy old week over here and a, and a hell in, of a lot of cake and a hell of a lot of cake in the Cheshire office um <laughs> but we we are back and so we're gonna be uh not that any of you would know by a the brand way brand new episode not that you no. would know because that's how no. seamless this podcast we're is seamless guys we've been away seamless. and we've been traveling you wouldn't even know that's the what beauty you know? of this podcast like the lock. yeah yes. clever what can clever, i say clever clever Right, but on that note, we are going to get into this week's episode, and you may know we've had a break then, because I don't know how good this is going to be, so (laughs) bear with us. Lisa and I both recently listened to a TED Talk Daily by filmmaker Robin Hauser. In this episode, Robin talks about the idea that when women lead, bias can often follow, specifically the concept of competence and likability, and that these don't often have equal measure for women in leadership roles. For example, due to gender norms, when women demonstrate leadership qualities such as assertiveness or confidence, they can be penalised or not liked. Why? Well, because these qualities don't often align with gender stereotypes on how women should be. And so we can often find strong, confident women easy to dislike, but don't have the same reaction to men who demonstrate these same attributes. So, Lisa, what are your thoughts on this likability theory impacting women in leadership roles that Robin talks about in her TED Talk? I think this is so interesting. Mm. When when I listen to this TED talk from Lisa, uh, from Robin, not Lisa, that's me. It's because her <laughs> name's Robin, and I'm like, my middle name's Robin, so I'm like Lisa Robin. Robin, I feel like we're kindred spirits, me and Robin. Yes. Um, yeah. Easily when I listen, confused. yeah. When I listen to Robin's episode uh, on the TED talks about this likability challenge, I felt it was so true and so relatable in so many ways, both from the perspective of my own personal experience about when I feel that I have been judged on asserting myself and possibly adopting traits that are more stereotypically linked to male but also and I'm being really honest and transparent now me disliking women who are being overtly um you know assertive confident yeah hard harsh in in that same respect so it's like I do think this whole being likable being a successful strong leader as a woman I do think the challenges around this are quite complicated and I do think they are totally like woven into like I think how I've been like brought up through education and Mm. work work more so actually than education because I went to an all-girls grammar school and we were very much taught to be and encouraged I would say to be successful strong-minded strong-willed independent to voice and share our opinions to be you know, to like to represent ourselves, I think, to be independent. Like I do really feel that way. And there was a boys' grammar school in the town that I went to school in, and we were often pitched against them, but in the re- in, in the respect of we're better than them, <laughs> I might add. Um, but I felt like in school and education, actually, I was very much encouraged to be um assertive in, in a respectful professional way, clearly, because you know we were harshly um reprimanded if we were you know if we over asserted ourselves especially in respect of the teacher pupil positions I don't mean in that term but yeah. like it was encouraged and I actually think it was the workplace where this I think my approach to this started to get quite heavily impacted and like quashed at times um but yeah I just I do think it's so true 
I really do. But I'm, I know I am guilty of it in terms of I want to be an assertive, successful, confident female leader, but I want to be liked. I know that for a fact because I am a bit of a people pleaser. Um, and I don't like being disliked, even by people I don't like, which is a bit weird. So I'm allowed to lo- dislike other people, but I'm not allowed to be disliked. It's they're very not odd. allowed to like you back. Yeah. They're not allowed to dislike me back. Sorry, yeah. dislike you back. Yeah. yeah, they have to like me. So my enemies have to think I'm brilliant. It's that kind of, it's a very strange dynamic, I guess. But there we go. Something to do with like wanting to be better than them at all times. Um, but yeah, but however I'm allowed to, that's that's what I mean, but however I'm allowed to dislike people. So it's, you know, I'll throw my hands up to this. I'm being honest. I know I'm being a hypocrite, but, you know, it is, there probably will, have, there, oh, it's not probably, I know if you're a fact, there will be leaders in my career that I've worked for who are women, who I've shown a dislike to. And it's possibly because actually they've been the sort of woman who has been assertive and probably assertive towards me and I didn't like it but that yeah I don't know whether that's it's I don't think it's their assertion that I'm not just that I'm disliking potentially often it was their well yeah possibly their point of view or I didn't agree with the decision or I didn't like the manner of their assertion and you and I have just you know, not long release an episode around assertiveness and how actually there is a balance to be struck between asserting yourself and still being polite. And I I do think that's sometimes where this goes wrong, but I would still argue it's true that it's women that get judged on that, not men. Yeah. It's very rare that I think I've ever seen anyone criticise a male for being assertive and impolite, whereas women we get criticized for being impolite yeah because it's not synonymous with with that gender stereotype women are polite and nice aren't they it's oh it's so weird sorry I've like garbled on there for about 10 minutes because I think that's (laughs) that's my point this is so interesting and it's so complicated isn't it it is and it's like you it's like an onion you start kind of peeling it off and then you you start thinking about like other bits of this and, and everything that's exactly how I felt so when I listened to this TED talk um it's, so it's available on Spotify, CBBS. So if you want to find it, you can find it on um, Spotify. We will also post a link yes, to we'll post a link to this it. episode. It's a really um, good, it's, it's only like four minutes long, isn't it, Susie? It's like, it's a real it, bite-sized listen. It's, it's a real bite size. I think it might be a bit longer than, than four minutes. but Yeah, I think it's about 12 minutes or so. Um, yeah. It's not long. Perfect for me. I've got a small <laughs> attention span. Um, so... I also kind of had the same reaction, I suppose. I've never really stopped, because you wouldn't, would you? And thought about this as a theory, as a concept around, Mm -hmm. actually, is some of our social conditioning in our, you know, whether that's in your education system, whether that's in your family setup, whether that's been in your working environment, you know, created some judgments for me about how I perceive women in leadership roles I've never really thought about it before okay and this TED talk definitely made me take a a second and pause and reflect and think have I done this myself and the answer is absolutely yes I have I have absolutely thought I don't particularly like you because you assert some attributes which at the time I didn't realize but they were probably being um assertiveness probably overconfidence um But I think there's probably elements within that where although they are great qualities for a leader, I think the intent behind them was different. And that's what I didn't like particularly like. I think it wasn't necessarily about those attributes in themselves. I think it's the intent was different. And I knew that. And that's why I didn't like it as well. But I've absolutely done it. I've made those snap judgments. Mm. And I think we all do. It's very common, you know. Let's not think that it's not. Like it is something which is absolutely, you know, we we will all do. We make judgments all the time. And we've talked about bias in previous yeah. episodes. Um, and it is all, all interlinked. I think the point you make there though about actually when women demonstrate some of those attributes, uh, do they have the same response from people as men do? I have definitely seen when I was working in sales in particular, there was a culture where there were a lot of males who demonstrated these attributes. 
and actually they were celebrated for doing so they were encouraged to do so and they were actually put on a pedestal I'd say around this is what good looks like and this is how Mm -hmm. you should be and how you were behaving and I remember one particular instance where I worked with somebody who was quite strongly opinionated on things is a very confident uh, woman is a very um, lovable person uh, and will tell you how it is and tell you straight and and actually like for myself I really enjoyed working with them because I always knew where I stood and again that goes back to that intent I knew their intent was to always yeah. be helpful was positive but they received a lot of I'll say backlash but I'll use that very kind of subtly I put that in kind of yeah. um, speech marks backlash because sometimes when they demonstrated those attributes, even though their peer set, who were male, were demonstrating them, they got a, a more negative reaction to doing that. So they'd be told they were a bit overbearing. Mm-hmm. They, they would be told that they were um, too opinionated, that they didn't listen you know, properly, that they weren't being collaborative enough. Um, and I know for a fact that um, they were just behaving and role modeling things that they were seeing in their peer set it just happened that their peer set was predominantly male and you know I don't know that those male counterparts didn't ever get any feedback but I'm pretty confident because I know how that those behaviors were kind of rewarded and were um looked upon that I'm pretty sure that there was no kind of um downside to doing that with them for their male um counterparts so I have seen this in action both yeah. in terms of watching my colleague and also I've done it myself I have made those snap judgments too isn't it interesting because you've you've used two words there in that example which I'm almost certain I've only ever heard in relation to women and not men and they are overbearing yes and opinionated I never hear those terms being used in direction or in description of a man's behaviour. But always when I've heard them, it's been in relation to a woman. Mm. I know they've been directed at me before. I've been told that I'm opinionated before. And I've been told that I'm overbearing. I do think often I'm an extrovert. If any of you had not worked that out yet, (laughs) there's that... (laughs) There's that revelation right there. There's that little light bulb moment for you guys. Um, (laughs) I think as an extrovert, you can often get categorised as overbearing Mm. because of your your natural preference and your your the way you prefer to behave has that. You know, you are an outward person. You think out loud. You share. Yes, Mm. it can mean that you're quite animated. I hate using the word loud, but I'm going to put it in there. It can mean at times maybe you are a little bit louder than others because you are enthusiastic and you're energetic and it all comes out like that, especially if if you get overexcited like me. Um, But that can often be swept all together into one category of overbearing. Um, (laughs) And it's like... um, And I think often that can be linked to being opinionated because people find that your opinion can be overbearing. Um, But that is only ever with women. I've never heard, I've I've never heard anyone say to a man, you're overbearing or you're opinionated. I think as well, you've just kind of um, triggered a thought for me. Like when you were saying that, I've also been um, called out before for the way I stand when I'm presenting. Stand? yeah so you know when you start if you're doing a big presentation yeah you know, where you kind of stand and you hold yourself like I like I do a lot of training I have done quite a lot of presenting before yeah. I'm about to do even more because I'm um I've just launched a, a new service in my business for keynote doing a keynote talk so I'm about to stand in front of a lot of people and I just remembered I'd actually forgotten about this and you've just kind of brought this back up in my mind that once I was presenting and I'd worked on my like I suppose like my posture like my body language so that I felt confident Mm. with what I was saying I was standing there with a level of assertiveness a level of listen to me I know what I'm talking about and that was more really I think from my to build my own my my own self-confidence there's a lot within that around you know the way you present yourself will make how you Mm. feel 
And I remember a male colleague said to me oh, when I'd finished, oh, like you had a really interesting like um, kind of posture, like sta- I can't remember the exact words they used, but it was like posture, like standing position, like you really like asserted yourself. And I remember at the time, just like not thinking anything of it and like laughing it off. But now you've just said that, I'm thinking, well, would they have said that to us if that had been a male, like stood there having that confident body language? What Would that have been something they would have picked up on and, and, it, and it had been worthy to kind of have a conversation about? I don't know. And I don't know the answer to that. But it just made me think like, why did you say that to me? Like, why does why was that needed to be said? It's just something that happened the way I was just kind of presenting myself. Yeah. Um, and I know I've also done it the other way around as well. So I have also done this where I have judged somebody for the way that they have interacted with an audience. And again, demonstrating perhaps some of those attributes which we're talking about here, you know, that, that real overconfidence, that kind of slight... I'd say kind of bullish nature that we're talking about here. And I've judged them a bit like, oh God, all right, like calm down. Like, what are you doing? And, and I and I I probably wouldn't have done that if that had been a male in that yeah. situation. So, you know, it's mm. it, it is very complex and it's very multi-layered what we're talking about here. And you know, there's no it's just a really interesting theory and a really interesting concept that I hadn't really thought about before until I listened to this. Yeah, I mean. I think it's one that I know I've wrestled with in over my entire career, especially when I've worked heavily in male environments. And I think I have changed my approach in those particular environments where they've been more male dominated to hold myself differently, speak more firmly. Yeah. Being more direct when I've had to interact more predominantly with men to I suppose, match them like for like and to ensure that I've been heard, listened to and been taken seriously. And I know that because that isn't necessarily, I mean, I like being direct. I do enjoy it because I like clarity and I like giving people clarity and I like to receive it. And I don't see directness as a negative. I think it gets used as a negative when actually it's just not. And it doesn't have to be. Like there is a way of being direct with people that doesn't mean it's painful. So I do think that still comes down to like the tone you use. Yeah. The words, your language. But I think, and I've, I've had this discussion with people before that I've worked with when they've given me that feedback and said, you know, I found what you said there quite difficult to receive. I found that quite direct and I've explained why I took the approach because I've said, I want to breed clarity for me, clarity breeds confidence. And that's what I was, you know, that was the agenda. That was the purpose. And they've come to then understand my approach and then have appreciated it once they've understood, like you've pointed out, actually, the intent that it was actually about trying to be helpful, nothing else. Um, so I know I've then adapted my style when I'm around different people to build relationships to, I suppose, yeah, to be more comfortable. So I do th- I do think it's about this whole notion of dialing up certain uh, attributes in certain moments to fit the moment, fit the audience, and to achieve what you're trying to 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 get as an outcome. Yeah. And that likability piece, you know, be- I've always wanted to be liked. I know that's true of me. That's why I say I'm a people pleaser. I do want to be liked, and I do think that's possible while actually, and like we've talked about in the assertiveness episode, while still being clear about your boundaries, by still being clear about what you think about things, sharing your opinions, that is all totally achievable. And I think you can still be liked for doing that. Because I know that there are women leaders and men actually, who I really respect and I really like, who do exactly that. Yeah. So it is totally achievable, but it's just this debate is very interesting because I do think it does take thought, conscious thought, conscious effort to think about how, you know, the right approach for you to take to be able to achieve both. Mm-hmm. And it's not always that straightforward. It's not always that easy. And how you get judged for it, I think because of our social constructs and our stereotypes that are so embedded in all of us, it's not always going to be possible. 
I think that's the point Robin Houser's making, actually. It's not actually always down to what you can do to influence. Yes, there will be elements. Of course there is. But it's not always going to be successful in every case because of this that exists there. So it's just so interesting to be aware of it, I think, and to and to acknowledge it, like all bias. Like Absolutely. We all have it. It's got to start with acknowledging it. Yeah. And, you know, some people might question is likability important in leadership mm. because you may argue like you're you aren't in a leadership role to be liked isn't that interesting because I do think that is what we're taught quite early on in our careers and it's this yeah. like it's this like old language that exists like you know I don't know if I agree with it though okay tell me more because I have to, my husband says this as well. Like when we've had to make tough decisions in our businesses previously, he said this. And I have to admit, that is the only time I find it helpful. If I know I've got to make a tough decision and it's not necessarily something, maybe that even I like, but I know is the right thing to do. If mm -hmm. I'm struggling with it because, you know, I'm a human being and because I like to be liked, I'm thinking, oh, how is this going to affect the other person? Having this kind of rhetoric of, you're not in leadership to be liked, you're in it to make a tough decision or whatever, it does help me to be able to get through it. But I don't I don't necessarily think you should assume that because you're a leader, you won't be liked. That's I suppose that's that's actually more where it, I don't think it's accurate. Okay. I don't think you're in any position in your life, any role for the sole purpose of being liked in it. That's not why you're there. So I suppose that's why I don't necessarily agree with it. But to flip it round, what I don't disagree, what I don't agree with is that you're there with the awareness that you're not going to be liked. Yeah. Because actually, I've got loads of leaders that I've absolutely loved and I still do, who I've worked for, who, you know, I've got, I really, really like them. And a big reason why I like them is because I think they're bloody amazing at their job and they embody all the leadership values that I think are really critical to be successful as a leader. And that includes being assertive and setting boundaries and being direct. And I'm sure actually knowing full well, they've had some really challenging conversations with me where I felt really uncomfortable and found them really hard and where they haven't been celebrating me. Do you know what I mean? They've been telling me some stuff I really need to sort out but I still like them for it if anything I love them for it. I love them even more because they had those difficult conversations with me like they were brave and bold enough and appreciated in their own um role and what it meant and what they needed to do in it to have those conversations with me yeah and do you think that could be because you are female so if that was to be in, uh, they were having those conversations with somebody who is male do you think like and then it's hard to answer that because we are female but you know knowing that person as you did do you think their approach would still be responded to in in the way that you responded to it as a female if it was to be a male well I've got one leader in mind when I'm saying this one very specific one where actually the team of leaders that he managed mate was made up of men and women and all of us feel the same way about him okay OK. Well, and, I, and I know that he was just as direct with me. Yeah. But actually, that is a fair point. He could be direct with me because I was direct and we had that relationship and there was that trust. Yeah. I do think he was as honest with other people in my team. Was he as direct as he could be with me? I don't know. But that's because, and there's no wrong in this, I think if I demonstrated an ability to receive directness, he could be direct everyone's different and the other people in my team I'm not saying are the same as I am so would they have been able to receive it manage it process it as successfully as I can possibly not but I think he would he would have then um, adapted his approach I don't think it means he was any less honest if that makes sense mm -hmm. but actually I had a conversation with one of my colleagues who had the same manager as I did um, uh, about a month ago and we still both talk about him as fondly as we did at the time and he still talks about him and all how good he was to him um, and talks about his honesty and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I do think we all appreciate them in the same way.
Oh, it's so interesting, isn't it? And you start to like peel it back and start looking at the different inputs to this kind of idea around likability. Um, and it's really interesting. Okay, so what would be your top tips then <gasps> for helping us to reconsider perhaps our snap judgments and to support, support us all in redefining those stereotypes? Big question there. It's such a big question. Such Did a big question. Do? Such a big question. Um, I think, do you know what? I think the only way to challenge bias is to be aware of it in the first place. And I think my first top tip would be the next time. I mean, if we're talking about this very much in the context of women as well. So if you're a man listening to this, or if you're a woman listening to this, it's, you know, it's for everybody. But I think you know, we are talking about that bias towards women and likability and leadership. So let's focus it in there. But I think it would be, a, be aware of it in the first place. And the next time a female makes you feel uncomfortable, question yourself as to why and what it's actually about. Because I think it's too quick and easy to say and blame it on an attribute. I think to your point, Susie, you know, you shared your experience of it. And actually it's it's often that you're sensing an agenda on an intent that you don't align with that's that's triggering that then outward behavior that you're seeing. So I, I think challenge yourself in your own thinking around what is it that is making me feel uncomfortable here? I think the other tip for me is appreciate the context in which that you are experiencing it because actually all of us are trying to exist in our roles in work to be successful to get on some of us are surviving only some of us are trying to thrive the the fact is is that the culture we work in influences how we behave and i think it is acknowledging that and just sometimes throwing each other a bit of a bone and going let's just call that out and acknowledge that it's existing and therefore the person we're experiencing right now their behavior is being influenced by that potentially so let's also like appreciate that too yeah I love that. I love what, that. What would you add? Well, my first top tip is a very practical one, which is actually listen to this Spotify, uh, this TED talk on Spotify. <laughs> listen to the TED talk. <laughs> actually listen to it because, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is going. Um, it really did, when I listened to it, it really did make me just stop and think about yeah. myself and those judgments that I have made mm. about certain women in leadership roles and made me just think actually was that right what what was the real purpose behind that um and it was interesting I learned quite a lot about her experiences of it as well being in the filmmaking industry yeah which is predominantly male dominated so my first top tip is absolutely just go and listen to it like <clears throat> I think it will be a good listen that there will be no downside to hopefully um my other top tip is actually really simple and it's something that I talked about before and I call it the three eyes and that is intent 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 <laughs> so you know think about what is the intent behind your judgments or your feelings about something and also what is the intent back from that person so what are they trying to communicate to you what are they trying to say are they trying to help you like what is their agenda here um and I think if you just keep that word in the back of your mind when you're perhaps kind of facing this or thinking about this or just let it kind of drift into the consciousness you know when you're at work um that might just help you kind of make sense of, okay, why am I having this reaction? Why am I having those judgments? Mm. Um, why do I not like that person? Actually, is that because I've been conditioned to not like them because they're demonstrating certain attributes, which I find not, you know, in the realm of this kind of social conditioning and these gender norms, or is it actually because they are truly 
being an idiot and I don't like them you know like that's the kind of piece that only you can unpick at the time and only you can do that um but yeah intent 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 is my final top tip it is now time for bullshit bingo where Susie and I call out phrases which get commonly used in the workplace that quite frankly make us cringe so Today's bullshit bingo is another one from our LinkedIn community, and it is push the envelope. <laughs> so come on then, Suze, what are your thoughts on this one? So this bullshit bingo came up a couple of times, one on LinkedIn. So we did, I did a LinkedIn post, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going, um, and a couple of people commented this one push the envelope so I feel like this is an absolute classic I have used this myself I don't know um, what it means I've never used do you it not? no I've never used right. push the envelope I don't know what it means so I would use push the envelope in the context of like let's push things to the next level like let's push the, let's push the envelope here like stretch let's think about how we accelerate things like, like growth like that's how I would use it in the context of let's push the envelope let's see what's the maximum we can get to like the what's limits. the relevance of the envelope <laughs> in relation to this so I always see it as literally pushing an envelope through a letterbox like and, well yeah fair dues I mean I did get that part of it but what I didn't quite understand just, you was... know push it through like let's keep pushing let's push the envelope let's keep going like let's aim for that next like bit that next stage that next milestone whatever it is I didn't say I could make sense of it I just said that's how I used it <laughs> so, yeah this is a weird one for me I don't but think I've ever heard anyone use it so this came up a few times on LinkedIn like a couple of people commented and I think it might have come up on Instagram as well um that yeah push the envelope yeah classic for me absolute classic well I'm I'm flummoxed. I don't think I've ever heard of it and I don't really get it. I don't see how pushing an envelope through a letterbox. I mean, progress, fine, but I mean only when I suddenly realise that it's someone's birthday and I've forgotten and I'm it's a miracle I've actually managed to get a card into them. So that's progress if I've managed to remember your birthday and sent you a card. But I don't really get and you, this one. And you even push that envelope through yourself if you've got somebody a card. Like, guys, we live in the digital world now. Like who's hand delivering cards? I'm certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I mean, you know, I, I meant I've got a physical card and I put it, I pasted it in the letterbox to get to their house. That's what I meant. Anyway, guys, if you've got a bullshit bingo that's better than push the envelope, there's got to be one out there. Um, please email us at hello at the coachingcast.co.uk or you can send us a message on Instagram. Send us a DM message. Us. DM us, yeah. Wherever you can find us, send us a message. We uh, just keep in contact. Yeah, send us your <laughs> Keep it coming and keep those envelopes coming. Come on, guys. Let's, you can even send it through, through like, with, by, via a pigeon. Like, let's get those envelopes attached. We'll, we'll, take, it, we'll take any form of mail. Mm, it's fine. Yeah. Air mail. <laughs> We are coming to the end of today's episode where we've discussed the likability factor in female leadership. So our top tips and recommendations from today's episode are number one, just actually listen to the TED talk. It's really interesting <laughs> and really fascinating. So that has got to be a top tip. Number two, intent, intent, intent the three eyes have a think about what actually is the reasoning behind these judgments or the communication number three stop so actually question what are your what are you feeling and why so if you're suddenly not particularly liking somebody uh in that leadership position especially if they're female just stop pause and question yourself and think why is that and number four acknowledge and appreciate the context of the situation, which kind of links back to that intent piece as well. So just think about what might be the reasoning behind that. We also have some self-coaching questions, which you can ask yourself. And these will also be available on our Instagram page. Number one, what does being likable in leadership mean for you? Number two, 
Are you aware of any differences in your likability of male versus female leaders? And take a moment to reflect on what might be the reason behind your answer. And number three, how can you improve your awareness of any snap judgments you may make of others? Some quite powerful self-coaching questions. They are good questions, questions this week, Suze. Thanks. All thought up by Susie, everyone. They are good yeah. questions. They are Thank good. you. I'm a coach, don't you know? <laughs> so <laughs> don't worry if you can't remember these. All of our top tips and recommendations will be on our Instagram page this week at The Coaching Cast. We hope you enjoyed today and have some new ideas to take away and try for yourselves. If you've got any questions, thoughts or feedback, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us in three ways. On email at hello at the coachingcast.uk, on Instagram at the coachingcast. And finally, you can contact us through our website, which is thecoachingcast.co.uk. Your support helps more than you know, CBBiz. So... If you like what you have heard today and in our other episodes and would like to help us grow this podcast so that we can keep bringing you episodes, please do us a favour, leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. You've got no idea how important these are. Hit subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a follow on Instagram at The Coaching Cast. Don't forget, you can also watch each episode on our YouTube channel by searching for The Coaching Cast. We both love music and use it to motivate and energize us. So we like to finish each episode with our personal song recommendation, giving you positivity and energy as you launch into your next meeting. It's my choice this week and I have chosen Beyonce, Break My Soul, which is her brand new single and it is insane. You I can't love break it. My soul. I love the song. You can't break Lisa's my just singing it now. You can't break my soul. <laughs> you can't break my soul. And it's not as obviously Beyonce does a much better job, but only just. Only just. Only just. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, if you want to hear Beyonce singing Break My Soul uh, and compare it to Lisa's version there, you can obviously uh, find it wherever you get your music as well. Thank you so much for listening, CBBs. Have a great week. And remember, You've got this.